Good evening, everybody. Tonight we got Rick Harris. He's going to teach us some of the basics of FPP, how to get it loaded, and how to start playing with it. Rick, take it away. Righty, let me share my screen here. All right, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yep. All righty, let me get this dang bar out of the way. All righty. So, my name's Rick Harris. I've been doing animated light shows for over six years. I'm part of the FPP development team, mostly in testing and documentation. And in this class, we're going to be going over basic FPP setup. So, what we're going to cover is... What is FPP? What do you need to run FPP? The installation methods, the initial configuration, and what is the best way? That's what everybody wants to know, what the best way is. So this class should provide you the basic information you need to, that you need to get FPP up and running, but everyone is different. Everyone's show is different. Everyone's layout is different. So hopefully, I'll go over the basics of setting up FPP, but I'm not going to have time to go over every scenario, but it should give you enough information and resources to tailor FPP to fit your needs. I'm going to be going over a lot of different things, but not into detail, because there's, there's other videos and stuff out there on the details. This is just going to give you the overview of what you probably should be ready for. So let's get started. So what is FPP? FPP is a software program that has basically two components in one. You have the show player. That's like the conductor of your light show. It's going to tell the controllers what to play, when to play it, what color to make each light. So obviously, you only want one player in your show. You don't want two different devices telling things what to do, or it's just going to be a hot mess. One important thing to consider is that your show player should also be the source of your audio output which is typically to an FM transmitter, but it could be to speakers as well. This is because the BeagleBone and Pi's internal clocks are not very accurate, and having another device output the audio besides the player can oftentimes result in poor audio quality. Not always, and there's some things you can do to reduce these issues and sometimes eliminate it. It's just not a recommended method. Then you have the controller interface. The controller interface is typically used in conjunction with a hat attached to a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone, but you can connect pixels directly to the GPIO pins. The controller interface is where you'll configure the ports and other controller-specific items. But wait, there's more. FPP has a lot of other functionality as well. Who knows, maybe that'll be covered in a future class, I don't know. But you can use just the player part of FPP for example, like having a Raspberry Pi as your show player, sending data to your controllers. Or it could just be a controller receiving instructions from another player. But what's neat is you can have an FPP-based controller that is both a controller and a player at the same time. And the player part will send the data not only to the controller portion of itself, but to the other controllers. And those other controllers don't have to be FPP-based controllers. So what are you going to need? Network configuration. Now, I go over, talk about this first, because a lot of people don't realize when they first get started that you need to have some sort of network so that you can talk to it. Um, a network is basically when you have two or more computer devices that need to talk to each other. So when you're setting up FPP, you should probably take a little bit of time beforehand to decide how you're going to connect to your FPP and decide on the network configuration. If you're not sure what you're going to end up doing, just pick one of the simplest designs and go from there. Now, there's not enough time in this class to go into details of networking. There's a bunch of videos on the subject, but I am going to go over it briefly to give you a little bit of overview. Then you're also going to need a compatible device or cake. You need something to put it on. And that's typically a Pi or a BeagleBone single board computer. 
Now, if you're using any of the BeagleBone series, you might need a network adapter depending on your network design. The Pocket Beagles don't have any type of network device on it. So if you, you're going to need something for it, um, either a Wi-Fi adapter or an Ethernet adapter or both if you're doing that. If you need both, it's up to you. And the BeagleBone Blacks, they have an Ethernet adapter, but they don't have a Wi-Fi adapter. Um, and it's not a big deal to get it. And then a power source. You need an appropriate power source. And the biggest reason I mention this is with the Pi 5s coming out, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people that are going to get a Pi 5 and just try and swap that out with their older Pis and use the same power supply. The Pi 5s use a lot more power and they run hotter and you're probably going to have to do some sort of active cooler on it. And in FPP, you really don't get any benefit. Uh, Raspberry Pi 3B Plus has way more power than what FPP typically uses. So you don't really gain a whole lot. But if you're going with a Pi 5, make sure that you have enough power. Then a micro SD card. Now, the SD card, that is the heart and brains of your entire show. So don't skimp on this. Get a good quality name brand card. And you probably want a class 10. And an application class is probably a, a, a lot better. Um, an 8 gig is probably good, big enough for most people. But 8 gigs are hard to find nowadays. So uh, 16 gigs would be plenty. But be careful where you buy it, especially if you're buying by eBay or some sort of other type budget place, because there's a lot of counterfeit cards out there. They don't, they look like the real thing, but they're not. So just be careful. And you might need to get an SD card adapter if your computer um, doesn't have the appropriate slot for it. So that you'll have to evaluate to find out if you, your computer has a card for it. Then an FPP image, you need to have the software. And I recommend getting the most recent image and then update to the current version for that image and keep it updated. Um, they're always doing improvements and bug fixes and performance enhancements all through the year. So might as well get the best of everything. About the only time I wouldn't suggest updating is if you have your show up and running. At that point, if it's up and running and no problems, don't, don't upgrade. And then you're going to need some sort of imaging software. The three most popular are Bolina Etcher, .NET Disk Imager, and Raspberry Pi Imager. I've used all three. They all three work really well. A uh, big advantage of the Raspberry Pi Imager is if you don't have the software already loaded, that it'll automatically download the software for you and install it. I personally use the .NET Disk Imager because I've used it for years and it's a lot, to me, a lot clean, cleaner and quicker interface, but that's just personal preference. Um, but any three of those are going to work great. So let's get into networking. Networking is probably the most misunderstood part of this hobby. And it, but it's actually the more, one of the more critical parts. If you can't talk to your controller to tell it what to do, it won't work. If your player can't talk to your controllers to tell them what to do, it's not going to work. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of networking. As like I said, that's better suited for another class. But you should have a little knowledge of how they work just to give you an idea to decide what you're going to do. We've actually had people come in this Zoom room with problems and in order to try and troubleshoot, we'll ask them how they have their network configured. And they say, oh, I don't need a network. I'm talking directly from my computer, computer to my FPP. Well, like I said, you have to have some sort of network. You might not have uh, realized that you did, but you did. And another thing that makes it a little more confusing and difficult is there's a lot of incorrect information and advice floating around in the Internet. So be careful in what advice you follow. So there's three basic types of network design that we use in our hobby. First one is a show network. That's where you typically connect another router to your home router and then have everything in that uh, subnet all wired together, typically through the router. Um, that's not typically needed. A lot of people preach that that's what you should have, but that's only because 
they don't understand that. Uh, home network, that's where you have everything in the same IP range as your home network. And we'll go into some examples of that in a little bit. And then you have a standalone network, and that's where you you don't have anything tied back to your home or anything. It's just like a whole little standalone thing. And that's typically used for like parade floats or cars or golf carts. But a very common show design, and more realistically, is actually a mix and match type of network. You might have a little bit on your home network and a little bit on a show network. And that's, a, that's more realistic for most people. Not always, but a little more realistic. So when you go over the installation methods, there's three methods of installing FPP. The USB tether method. Now, I've got that asterisk because um, there, are, there were some cult-like controllers that were built with a USB chip that didn't meet the specs that he specified. And if you hooked up the USB tether cable to it, it would burn up the power regulator for the USB, and then it would work. So be careful if you're using this method on any of the cult controllers. Verify that it's one that will work. If you're not sure, don't chance it. You don't want to burn up your controller before you even have it configured. Then you have Wi-Fi tether. Wi-Fi tether is where... Um, you, you can you do everything over Wi-Fi for the initial setup. It's pretty convenient. You don't have to go hunt down where your router is. You just hook it up. But that requires that you have a Wi-Fi adapter that supports AP mode. AP mode is an additional feature on Wi-Fi adapters that basically allows it to act as a router. Um, be careful where you get it. I purchased a bunch of uh, Wi-Fi adapters from Amazon that said they supported AP mode. I plugged them in and they did not work. They even said they were for Linux-based devices and they didn't work. So now I buy all mine from Dan. That way I know that they are going to work. So but, um, the, the, all of the Raspberry Pi, their, their adapters support AP mode. So you don't need to get an additional adapter for it. Their onboard Wi-Fi supports AP mode. And like I said, that's a very convenient way to configure FPP, at least for the installation. And then after that, you adjust it for what you need. Then you have a network connection. That's for any device that has an Ethernet port. And you hook that up to your router. Don't hook it up to your directly to your computer. You can do it directly to your computer, but you have to do some additional configuration and to me, it's not just worth the hassle. If you just plug it into the router, it's going to work a lot easier. So that's the different ways that you, you'll install FPP. So let's go over the initial setup. There's a few things on the initial setup that I want to go over. And I actually have three. Where did they go? I actually have three FPP devices that I have. i got this main player. I've got this one here that is in the very raw stage, and this one here. The, the first two, the, the bridge and the main player, those two, they're just a basic install and have been updated to the most current version, and that's it. I haven't configured, as you can see, any outputs or anything. And this one is, you see, I just used FPP local to get into it, and the initial setup. So in the initial setup, due to some IoT laws, they have to make you do this. They cannot select default for the UI password and the OS password. So that's something that they added a couple of years ago just because it's some of the IoT laws. Now, the UI password, this here will make it to where accessing your web page here will require a password. To me, making a password for your FPP interface is like putting a lock on your refrigerator in case somebody breaks into your home. I highly doubt if somebody hacks your network, if the first thing they're going to do is go into FPP and play Baby Shark over and over again. I have a feeling they're going to be looking for something else. But you have to choose something. So we're going to choose disable. And it's essentially the same thing for the OS password. The OS password is going to be what you use for the SSH shell. But like I said, they already have to be in your network. So I'm going to set it, I like to set it to default. We've had people that have come in and we needed to get into the shell. 
and they didn't remember what their password was. They changed it thinking it was best to change it. And then they had to re-image because they didn't remember. Set the player mode. In this case, it's going to be a remote. Now, the host name, you, you want to give it a unique name. Um, there's some methods that use host names. Host name is essentially like an IP address. If you have duplicate host names, just like if you have duplicate addresses, you might not be going to the place that you want it. If you only have one FPP device, you could use uh, FPP. Um, but if you add another one, now you're going to be changing. So we're going to make this one FPP. What is this? This is the K8 PBD. Um, post description, this will give you additional information in uh, multi-sync and other areas if you need it. The email address, if you have the crash data enabled, and another thing, if you see a red or yellow banner up here, you have to take care of that. Fix whatever the problem is that it's saying. The yellow banner indicates that if you don't fix it, it's likely that uh, something is not going to work correctly. The red banner is if you don't fix it, it's highly likely that it's not going to work as expected. But we're not going to reboot it yet until we get done. Um, but like I say, in the email address is if you have the crash data going to the developers, if they see something that they could that they could get if they need some additional information, like maybe have you send them a log report or uh, change your log uh, levels, um, that way they could send an email to you and have you do that. And it might get your problem fixed a little bit quicker if you add that, but that's totally voluntary. Share statistics. This is going to send anonymous data, their personal data is sent to the development team that they could look at. They could see like what hat or cape you're using, how many ports you're using, uh, if you're using any plugins, uh, things like that. So if you pick banner, you'll get a little reminder up there saying you want to send data, you can disable it or you can enable. I suggest, I don't know why I didn't say, but we'll find out here in a minute. Um, and then the fetch cape logos and send cape serial number. Some people don't like the idea of getting a logo for the capes. We've got the little logo up here where it says cult lights and the little thing. Um, there's not enough uh, room on the EEPROM to save images and stuff. So if they want to get the fancy logo, Got to reach out to the vendor to get uh, the locale here. Um, we have Canada, global, and USA. This is used for holidays. Say, for example, here in the United States, that um, we've got Easter and Thanksgiving. Those are go away. Those are holidays that uh, the um, that change. It's not on the same date. So, in the scheduler, you can use. Um, just select that day. The time zone, that's going to be the time zone to keep the correct time. Uh, if this was connected to the internet, which I don't think it is, it'll look up the time zone. Yeah, it, it's, it is. So it, it is hooked up to the internet. And so the time zone obviously will give you the correct time. Um, it's not one seventeen in the morning. Um, and latitude and longitude, that's used for um, your scheduling as well. If you want to use like sunrise or sunset type issues, they have a dawn, a dusk, a sunrise, sunset. Those, that that's get calculated based on your latitude and longitude. So let's see. This guy is wanting to act funny here. I'm not sure why he's changed the host name and you run FPP local. Oh, that's right. And I always set that the very last thing so I don't run into this. And because I'm teaching the class, I got sidetracked. Okay, so hey, PB test banner. We're gonna set this, and that's the thing. If you taste change the host name, 
I accessed it by fpp.local to originally get in here. When you change the host name, it's going to change how you access it. So you have to go back to this host name. So let me go ahead and do these, include saving, click to Cape, locale is USA, go time zone, look up location, and now we're doing good. Okay, so once you, the, the two main things that you have to do is the UI password and the OS password. So then we're going to finish the setup. Red banner, got to take care of it. We're going to do the storage settings, go to the file system. Yes. And it's done. And now you have to reboot it. We're going to reboot it. So we're pretty much done with that. And let's Takes a second for it to come back up. And then what I want to do is it's going to take a little bit. Let me go back to the PowerPoint while that's thinking and we'll come back. Okay. Um, then we'll can, oh, I should have configured the network while I was there, but that's okay. Um, then, you, and also, too, a lot of people. They get antsy, they get their controller, and they want to go through and just test it. And they'll go test it and they say, hey, it's not working. Or, hey, I only got 50 pixels of my 100-pixel string not working. The controllers, when you first get them, either FPP or any of the others, it's they're going to have the ports configured maybe. You might have zero pixels per port configured. It might be 50. It might be 100. And it's only going to output what you have configured. So if you are going to be doing testing without going through X lights and uploading your information, um, check your ports and, make, and add some pixels if you need it. Okay, so then now you probably should understand a little bit about Player Remote and or E131 in DDP, what they are and how they work. Um, so there's basically four types of data protocols used in our hobby to get lighting information from the player remotes to the controllers. And think of these data protocols as a language. If both sides of the conversation speak the same language, then there's no problem. E131. Almost every controller can process E131 data. It's not a bad choice. DDP. Most of the newer controllers can also process DDP data. DDP data is more efficient than E131, but depending on your show, you might not see the benefit, but it is a lot easier to configure. Then you have ZCPP. And as far as I know, the only controller that supports this protocol are the Falcon controllers, and the only player that supports it is Xschedule. FPP does not support ZCPP. Then you have multi-sync. Multi-sync is way different than the other protocols, and we'll get into that. But all FPP-based controllers support multi-sync, and there are several other controllers on the market that support multi-sync as well. Multi-sync is by far the most efficient protocol. FPP and XSchedule both support the multi-sync protocol. If it's not an FPP-based controller, um, you'll have to check with that controller and make sure that they do support it. Let's go back to this guy. Okay, so he's back up and running. And like I said, we're going to go ahead. Let's go to the network on this guy. And actually, we'll, we'll just leave him at the, the KAPB test local. But if you wanted to configure it, you go in here and configure what you need. If you're using two interfaces and you're using static addressing, um, you only want one of the interfaces to have a gateway. FPP will auto-populate it to guess what you might need, but only one. And the gateway you want to be on the side that's facing your router or to the, the internet, whichever it happens to be. So, but we're just going to keep it with this uh, FPP KPB test to make it easier. So that's how you do the networking. And then to upgrade this, all we're going to do is click on 
up. This will tell you this green bar here tells you upgrade is available. And if you want to see what changes are there, if it if it's something that might benefit you, like say maybe something is act, acting kind of wonky, you really don't want to update unless it's going to fix it. You click that and it'll show you what is going to be. And this is just a version level upgrade. It's going to keep you in the 7.5 branch. If you want to upgrade to one of the newer ones, you can go in here, but we're not going to go into that. So we're going to upgrade this one so it'll be upgraded when we come back to it. All right, so let's get back to where we were. Okay. So here is what's typically referred to as a home network design. And so if you're going to be sending E131, VDP, or ZCP data, it's all identical in the process. The player is going to send all of the channel data through the network, and in this case, it's typically a wired network. It doesn't take much Wi-Fi data for it to get congested. And this here, we have an FPP. This here signifies a player only, but this could be a controller as well. Um, that, like I said, you could have an FPP device that's going to be both a controller and a player. Um, and if you're using a dedicated player, like this here being FPP or X schedule, this could be X schedule, but we're not talking about X schedule. All of your controllers over here are going to be either E131 bridge or remote. Um, the Falcon controllers would be considered E131 bridge and your FPP based controllers would be remotes. FPP, you only have two options, player and remote. Player is the one that's telling things what to do, and remote is getting information from somebody else. So the typical data flow would look something like this. Going to send out all the pixel data, go to the switch, then over to the controller. Send all the pixel data to the switch and over. And that's going to happen 20 or 25 or 50 times a second, or 25 or 50 milliseconds, 20 or 40 times a second. So you can see that's a lot of, lot of data potentially could be going over. And if you notice, none of that traffic went anywhere near your home network. This switch is going to isolate everything from your home network. And just like your home network, the only time that any data is going to be going over that is if you're on your computer and doing a configuration for FPP. And that traffic isn't isn't anything really. So you can see how that's a route that it does not impact your show. Like a lot of people say you have to have a show network. That's not true. So, but this can, with, with the advent of these high def props and people going to P5 panels and virtual matrices, um, we've seen a big boom in that lately. This can sometimes be a lot of data, even for a, a network like this. So that's where multi-sync comes into play. And you see here, it's still the same home network design going through the switch and wired and but it's very different and it's very efficient. Every device is going to have a local copy of the sequences and X lights will actually make a custom made sequence for each of the controllers. Now these controllers here have to be in a multi-sync capable controller. And again, this FPP here could be a controller slash player as well. But what it does is it will send extremely small sync packets that are basically just the sequence name and the frame that it's on. And these packets are sent out far less often than the E131 data. Sometimes only like one or two a second as opposed to the, the uh, 20 or 40. So, and then it'll work, looks something kind of like this. It'll say jingle frames, jingle bells, frame 1692. And a little while later, up oh, and now I'm on jingle bells frame 1845. And again, you notice no data is going through your home network. Now, because multi-sync is so efficient, many people will use Wi-Fi with it because that'll that you don't have the data issue that you do with the uh, E131 or DDP. And that might look something like this. And in this case, you have your home network and you have this FPP device communicating on your home network to the Wi-Fi. This controller is communi communicating to your home network via Wi-Fi. 
And this FPP is this FP this controller up here isn't uh, multi sync capable, so we're going to wire to it. And this FPP device can send out both multi sync and the E one thirty one data as well. Now, when you have an FPP device that has two interfaces, the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet, that is where you have to create what's called a separate network. So in this case, we actually have a home network design with a small separate show network for this controller over here that's wired. Um, but you can, if you want, make this controller over here Wi-Fi capable just by adding an FPP device and get rid of all the switches and wires and everything. And it'd be something like that, that you just add an FPP device. And now instead of your player down here being the one that is the separate show network, it's just going to be this FPP up here. It's still going to be everything's on your home network except for your small separate show network for this FPP over here. So X lights configuration. It's usually the easiest and best method to let X lights manage your controllers and FPP devices. In X lights, you typically only list controllers. You don't need to list your FPP device if it's only acting as a player. But to me, it clutters the screen. But you know that's personal preference. Um, so if a controller is FPP based or supports multi-sync and you're gonna use multi-sync, which like I mentioned is highly recommended, then in X lights, you're going to set it to X lights only. And what that means is that X lights is the only device that's gonna be sending the full pixel data, but for the show, it's gonna be listening for multi-sync data. If the controller is going to be receiving E131 or DDP data for the show, then it's gonna be configured as active. Another common uh, confusion is the UDP out. If your FPP device is wired to a controller that's anticipating E131 or DDP data, then you need to configure the UDP out. If it's not, then you don't. And we're gonna show some examples here in a little bit. And so here's, an example of a layout. I have my controllers configured like this. I have F, a, a FPP player. It's wired through a switch to, it's actually a, a, an F48, not the F16. Um, and because this is a separate show network here, when you have a se separate network, there's you have to provide some sort of routing. By default, Networks will not pass data from one subnet to another one, and that's pretty much for security reasons. So you have to configure some sort of routing. There's basically three ways. Here's a proxy, which is probably by far the simplest one. Not all controllers support proxy. Most of them do, but not all. Um, then you can create a route inside your router. Not all routers support it. Or you could create a route in your computer, and that means that it's only going to work from that computer. Um, so this FPP here, because it's wired to a controller, that has to have UDP out configured on it. This com this controller here is multi-sync, so it's just going to be accepting the multi-sync data. And this FPP device down here is going to be a separate show network. So you, we're basically going to have three networks. We're going to have the home network. We're going to have this small show network and this small show, show node. But with these proxy settings, um, then it, it just works. It makes it so much easier. So that's the example that we're going to use. And let's see what it looks like in X lights. So let me bring this down a little bit here. Um, so you see here, I've got, I have three controllers. I have, come on, go over. Woo. So I have the F48 over here, I, which is the, this one. It's wired to the main player. I have the Cult K8, which is this one here. This is just straight multi-sync. And then I have the F16 down here that's proxied through a remote. 
So that's the three controllers, but you notice I don't have these two FPP devices in here. I have three FPP devices in total, but I'm only listing one here, but you're gonna see how it all comes together. Now, one thing to in for X lights to be able to manage your um, controllers, you need to go through and I would give it a name that makes sense to you. Um, this is only used in X lights, so it really doesn't matter. But you need to have the vendor, which in this case would be Falcon, the model, which is an F48 V4, and the variant, depending on how you're going to use it, um, it's going to change the variant, and that you'll have to check with your controller what it's going to be. The ID, just make this something uh, unique between them. Uh, and here is the big thing. You want to do auto layout models, auto size, and full X lights control. That'll give you all the automation. Now you have default port brightness. If you have the majority of your lights are going to be a certain brightness, I would suggest setting it here. Then you don't have to go into X lights and adjust the brightness. And the important thing, it's got to have an IP address. Uh, you have it here, and then you have the proxy IP host name, which is going to be here. Now this, go over this FPP device down here. It's Ethernet side is 192.168.1.60. And because of that, I will make the controller IP address the 192.168.60 and make it three. And on my FPP on the Ethernet side, it's going to be 192.168.60.2. I try and avoid one only because there's some systems that one is reserved for a router. So I try and stay away from that. But you, the, Usually, you could use it as one, but you have that. But if you look with F48 right now, if we open it, it can't find it. It doesn't know where it is because we're um, – come back here. Okay. And come back here. So – we had we we tell it it's going to be a proxy, but we haven't configured the proxy yet. We haven't told FPP, hey, you need to pass this on. If you get the data, pass it on. And we can open the proxy, and that would open up that FPP device. But we're going to let Xlights manage that. So we have all three. We have these uh, controllers here. They're not configured for anything. So let's go ahead and configure that. So we're going to go to Tools, FPP Connect, and this is a neat thing with the FPP-based controllers is you can do like a whole lot of things at once. Uh, I forgot I got all my a lot of my controllers on, so it's going to open up and it's going to locate every device that can handle multi-sync. So you might have more than just your FPPs. If you've got a controller that supports multi-sync, they'll be in this list as well. Now the upload section here, this is basically you put a check next to the ones that you want to take an action on. I'm not going to do that one. Let's see, I got my K8 PD test, um, the bridge, and the K8 Pi test. And this tells you what the modes are, the versions, just for information. Now the sequence type, you almost always want to go with V2 sparse. Uh, media, you only want media going to your ma main player. I missed that one there. Okay, so your main player. So media, that's the only one. You don't need media going to any of the others. Models, FPP will auto-generate your pixel overlay models based on the pixel output ports, and that's usually the recommended way. Um, because if you do a pixel overlay model and the next time you upload and you've made a change, you're going to have a bad model. So if you let uh, FPP auto-generate it, it's always going to be correct. Some people like to test their models like from their main player. And in that case, you'll want to do set it to all. Um, but me personally, I like to test it from the individual controller. If, if there's communication not getting from the player to the controller, it's probably not a model issue. The UDP out. So here 
rehab. Uh, you know, let me close this down and move this over so we can see what we got. Okay, now we should be able to see what we've got. And FPP Connect's going to remember the settings that you had last time. So, in clear, down. Okay, then we have all that media only to the main player. And that's it. Models done. Okay, UDP out. So we have your main player here. It's sending data to the F48. So we want the proxy, the UDP out to be proxy. Now you can do all. If you do all, it's going to be sending data, all of the pixel data, to all three of your controllers. That's not what you want. You only want the multi-sync data going to these two controllers down here because otherwise you're sending double data and that'll cause glitchy, jittery, lagging. So you only want it to go to the one device and that would be proxy. Then this one down here going to the F16 bridge, you want that one going to the proxy. Um, and because we did not configure the proxy in FBP, you can actually tell Xlights to configure that proxy for you. Um, playlist, you can add the sequences right to a playlist. Um, that typically only the first time that you upload it, but you have to go in and do it. To me, I, I like going in and, and putting it in the order I want. Now, this pixel hat cape, if you check this, this will upload the output configurations that you have as well. So on your hats and capes that you're using, you might want to do that. And let's select a couple sequences so we have stuff in there. And we will upload. Probably because I'm uploading to a different FPP device. It's probably one of my test devices. You see, it's it's actually generated the unique sequence for each of those devices based on the channels and everything else, and then sending it up. Okay, so now that that's in, what happens if we try and open up this F48? Now it opens because it X lights, like I said, it's auto magically will configure it. And if we go over here to the main player, refresh this page, you see here it created the output for that controller, configured it with the correct number of channels and everything else. Um, so it pretty much configured everything for you, which is kind of a, a neat thing. Um, so that's the X slides part of it. Now, one other thing that on here is if you are going to use multi-sync, you have to tell your player what it's outputting. Now, X lights, there isn't a way in X lights that you can tell it that this is going to be sending out multi-sync. So you go to the multi-sync page, and all you do is you just select the send multi-sync path. And now that's going to send multi-sync packets to the devices that, as you have. Now, this is kind of neat. It gives you status messages, lets you know what's going on if you have a problem with a controller or anything else. So it gives you an idea what's going on. Like you see here, the K8 PB test, you see here that it's got no signal. Well, we didn't configure the Wi-Fi adapter on this, so it's still wired to the router. So... It's shown, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. You can see the platform. You can see, you know, what the status is, if it should be running or not. You'll, no, you can see things. It'll show sequences playing. 
shows you the version that you're running. And it also gives you a little indicator if there's an update available. Like for this one here, there's an update available. All of these others are updated. Gives you utilization and how uh, how things are running. Now, a neat, neat thing with um, the multi-sync is you can take a lot of actions on your controllers and do it all at once. So you can upgrade your FPP. So say you've got a whole bunch that need upgrade. You could upgrade it. Maybe you need to restart it for whatever reason. So you don't have to log into this K8 test. So let's see here. We want to do that one, and we want to reboot it. Say reboot and run. It's going to run. It's going to give you a status message as it's going. But you could select more than one option, more than one controller, and set any of these things. Say when you configured it, you accidentally set, um, oh, a real good example. I got my singing faces here. That should be a remote. So I'm going to set that to set to remote. So this one's still doing, have to wait for it to get done. So I'll go back into that. But you can see how you go in and change it to remote. Nope. Okay. While I'm talking, it did. So I'm going to set that one to remote. And it's done. So the multi-sync page is a, a pretty versatile page, so you don't have to log in and out of the devices. And let's go into your playlist. So playlist is where you're going to put all of your songs together. Um, typically, you're going to create one sequence for each song. Some people think that you have to merge them all together and do it. That's typically not a good idea because now you're going to have a huge sequence, huge render times. And if you find one little thing that you want to change or get rid of, you have to redo it all over again. Typically, the best thing is to have each song its own sequence. And then you create a playlist. <clears throat> playlist is just going to basically be um, a list of songs in the order you want them to play. So we're going to give it a name. Want to give it a description? You can. If you want it to be randomized, you can do that. We're going to add the playlist. And it's here. So then. Once you have a playlist, you're going to add the sequence if you want. And you just select, um, if it's sequence and media, then you're going to select this, and this will try and find the, uh, the song that goes with it. Or you could do a whole lot of other commands. We're not going to get into those. Um, but, you know, there's a whole lot of other options. So you're going to add the sequence. We're going to add it, and it's there. I'm going to add another one. We're going to add now all I really want. It's make just make a visual double check to make sure it picked the song for you. Add it. And we'll do one more. Everybody's favorite. So now you have all the sequences, but it might not be the order you want. So just come over here and click this little dot. And you can drag it wherever you want and put it. Now there's two additional items on here that's important to note, and that's the lead in and lead out. And what these are, these are a play once entry. So when this playlist starts, it's gonna play the lead in. And maybe you wanna have an introduction, a public service announcement, or if you're running like Remote Falcon, maybe you wanna turn viewer control on, but it only runs one time, then it'll play your playlist and it'll repeat it depending on your um, option. And we're going to go in that in a minute and then be done. It's just going to go over and over and over. Lead out, on the other hand, is when your schedule ends and it's time to turn off. If you select either of the graceful options, it will play the lead out. And this might be uh, thank you for coming to the show. Our next show is going to be whatever. or you know, if you have Remote Falcon, turn maybe turn the viewer control off or something like that. Some people will use to turn their porch lights on and off. So you have a bunch of different options. So now we have the playlist. So make sure you save it. I don't know how many times I've gone on, did all this work, and then I go up here and click on, on version 8, 
I believe if you try and exit, it's going to tell you that uh, you didn't save it. I know there's some options that we added that I don't remember if it's here yet. So we saved the playlist. Now let's go to the schedule. The schedule is where you're going to tell it when to start, when to stop, and how to stop. So we're going to add a schedule. You're going to put a start date if you want. Like I said, if we want you to do holidays, we can say this one, we're only going to start on one of these holidays. Well, I'll go back to specify the date. The end date, the days, you have several options. You go every day, or you could have select an individual day. And then they have a couple multi-day combinations that are useful. Then they have odd and even. Now, a lot of people get confused with this odd and even because they think it's odd and even calendar days. And so they say, hey, I have this set to play odd, and this is an even day of the month, and it's not playing. The, this odd and even, the intent of it is so how you have a different show alternating every night. So one night it'll be one, the next night are the other. If you go by the calendar days, if you have a sequence that, I mean, a calendar ends on the 31st, which is odd, what's the next day? It's the first, which is an odd. So you'd have back-to-back -back days. So the odd and even is actually based on, I believe, the FPP creation date is when it starts day one. And it's all, with that way, it's always going to be alternating. Then you have day mask. Maybe you have some specialty schedule, and you just select. Maybe you want Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So you can select, you know, any combination. So you have your start time. The schedule type most typically is a playlist, but you have other options. You can just do one sequence or a command. Uh, sometimes you might just want a command running uh, to turn off a show or something. And then you select based on this, your option. We have our playlist that we did. And then you have the end time here. Now, this is a trigger point. Nothing happens about the end until, until it hits this point. When it hits this point, then it's going to take this stop type into account. What graceful is, is that when it hits this trigger point, whatever song it is currently playing, it will finish that song and then play your lead out if you have one, and then stop. Then you have Graceful Loop. This will play your entire playlist. So maybe you have something special you want to go through to the end. And so say you have seven songs in your playlist. It hits 12 midnight. It's going to play, finish song seven, play eight, nine, and ten, and then it'll play your lead out and be done. And then the, re the repeat. This is how it's going to repeat. Most of the time, you don't have enough sequences to play. There are a few people, like I think Daryl Irwin's one of them, that they can't play all the sequences in one night. Um, but most of the time, you don't have enough sequences to fill the time frame that you want to play. Immediate, well, immediate, as soon as it gets done with the last song, it'll start the first song. Now, it's not going to play the lead in. It'll just go back to it. And that is typically the most common method. Now, you might have some special situation where you do f every five minutes. Maybe it's some animation for an entry or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, then you got 30 and 60 minutes. I've seen a lot of new people. They uh, come in and they have only like 15 minutes of, of, a, of sequences. And they go, well, shoot, I'm going to I want it to do every hour. That way, the top of the hour, it's, I'm going to play a sequence. And then at the end, it'll be an intermission. I'll just do lights. I personally think that's a bad idea. It's my personal opinion. I got into this hobby because I like going looking at light shows. It's been a pastime when I was a kid. It was kind of a family tradition. My parents took me out looking at lights. And now when I go out looking at lights, I don't plan where I'm going. I just drive and go. Now, I might have some places I want to go. And I'll go there. But if I show up, and it's some intermission or something like that, I'm leaving. It's Unless you have a super fancy popular show that you need to get traffic moving or something, playing it on the top of the hour or something, to me, I don't think benefits your viewers. And think of it, that, you know, you have a kid show up, the family shows up, they show up the last 30 seconds of your last song, they see 30 seconds, and now they have to wait 
when that little kid's disappointed, he didn't get to see, you know, any lights. But that's just my opinion, but it's something to consider. Um, let's go to the inputs. So if you want to use X lights to do testing type things like that, for, so test to the controller, you want to enable the input. Now, this is disabled by default as kind of a protection factor. Because if you have this enabled and you have and you're doing something in X lights and you accidentally hit the output to lights, you're going to be sending that data to the controller as well. And you're going to get all types of weird stuff. But for testing purposes, you might want to have that enabled. Then the outputs, what I was talking about. Uh, well, this one doesn't have a cape on it. Let's go to this guy here. He's updated. And let's go to his outputs. And I wonder if he was done updating when we did push the... No, he, he wasn't. Oh, that's weird. Uh, I, I forgot. We pushed the um, update. We uploaded the FPP Connect. He wasn't done updating, so he couldn't take the information. But you see, by default, it shows 100 pixels. So, like I was saying, if you had 200 pixels hooked up to one of these uh, ports, you're only going to get 100 light up if you do testing. Um, a neat thing with the um, the FPP based controllers is right here from the port page, you could do what's called port number testing. And what's going to happen, it, it's very, very common. We have seen dozens and dozens of times where people come in and have a problem. And they tell us, you know, I've checked, double checked, triple checked. My pixels are plugged into the right port. And we go through all this troubleshooting process. Come to find out they either marked the pigtail wrong, they plugged in the wrong port or whatever. So you have a pixel port test. When you do this, the first pixel will light up white with the port number. So the one that's plugged into port one will be one white pixel. And then the rest will go through an RGB pattern. The second, anything plugged into two, the first two lights will be white, and then RGB pattern. So that's a kind of a neat way to kind of troubleshoot. Then you can go pixel count by port. So this will light up, I believe it's every 50 pixels. The 50th pixel will light up white, and that's going to be by port. So it'll just do that for the whole thing. The pixel count by string, say you have several models on the port, it'll do up to 50 until it gets to the next supposed string and then startle. Then you have your traditional red, green, white, and then you also have display testing that gets into that. So that pretty much covers that. So let's go back to here. We went over the multi-sync page, playlist schedule, input outputs. Oh, the best way. Okay. So what is the best way? In this hobby, networking, controllers, controller configuration, layout, 5 volt, 12 volt, just about anything in this hobby. Everybody wants to know what the best way to do it is. And if you ask six people what the best way is, you're going to get seven ways of doing it. And they're all the best way. It's the best way for them. Your layout's different. Your controller design might be different. So it's up to you what you want to do. So the best way is what you understand and you can make work. Now, getting into the hobby, that doesn't really help you a whole lot. You're like, hey, I just want to do it. So pick any of the ways, the suggestions, and try it. Get it to work. Don't give up if you have problems getting it to work. You know, reach out and... Um, Get some help, but the best way is the way that you understand and can make work. And that goes right into getting help. There's several ways that you can get help in this hobby. And I have to tell you, Zoom Room is by far the best, quickest, and most accurate way to get help. I found out about the Zoom Room before right just shortly after I ordered my controller and my pixels from China and I was waiting for them to show up, I just hung out in the Zoom room and listened. And I learned so much in the Zoom room and I didn't even have a single controller or white to work with. And but when I got my controller and my lights, there was a lot of things that I did 
and something wasn't working. And I remember, oh, I remember they said to check this or check that. And it really helped me out a lot. Um, it's open 24-7, 365 days a year. This time of year in the, you know, in the off season, it might not be um, as popular with people in it to help you. But if not, come back. Um, the FPP manual has um, is fairly thorough, but I'm a little biased since I wrote it. But I do have a lot of examples for networking and a lot of other stuff that might be beneficial for the people that like reading manuals. We know nobody likes to read a manual. Then you have the forums. Those are those are pretty good out there. And then Facebook. Now, Facebook, in my experience, I found that you get people out there and they, they intend well. They want to help you out but they're fairly new in the hobby and they don't know the whole picture. And a lot of times somebody will post a problem and they didn't provide enough information to give you, to give them a good answer because you can lead them down one path or another to fix it. And I've seen people respond because they don't realize that there's more and they're, they're assuming based on their configuration. So Facebook, it's a little, little, Less iffy, I would say probably about 98% of the advice on there is, is great. Yeah, and there's that small percentage that might not work. So just take that with a grain of salt. But the forums, Facebook, any of those, depending on the problem, it could take you a day or two or three, depending on the problem, before you get it resolved. If you come into the Zoom room, it's very, very rare that you don't have your problem solved within 15, 20 minutes. So the Zoom room by far is a lot more efficient. So that pretty much covers it. Um, got any questions? Rick, I missed some of Did you go over about upgrading? When to upgrade, keep it updated? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Yeah, and I'll go go over it again. I, I, I highly recommend when you're going over your show, designing it, and everything else, upgrade it and keep it upgraded to the most current version. But because they're always fixing bugs, they're always doing performance enhancements and things like that. But if your show is up and running, don't upgrade. If it's up and running and you don't have any problems, I would not upgrade. Just in case there's some weird little thing. It doesn't happen often. But it's very frustrating because you normally don't find it till someone calls you on the phone and say, "Hey, this isn't working," and you kind of you, it's kind of hard to stop your show and redo it or whatever. But yeah, up until you get it up and running, keep it updated. I have a question. Um, this is my first year. Um, I noticed that for the testing, uh, you showed the page with the pixel count and all that. Is it better to test it from FPP or is it better to do it from the controller? I have Falcon controller. Okay, so if you're, if you're having problems, it's best to test from the source closest to the pixel. If you're wanting to test the pixels themselves, because if you like, for example, if you have FPP not configured correctly, or you have a bad wire or something like that, and you test from FPP, it's not going to work, and you don't and, and you think you have bad pixels. Where if you test it right from the controller itself, then you're pretty sure that it's not, you know, the pixels because you're right at the controller. So if you have it if you have it plugged into the port, you have the port configured for the correct number of pixels, and it doesn't work from the controller, that pretty much eliminates that it's a hardware issue at that point, either the controller, a fuse on the controller, or the pixels. So my, my advice is always check from the source closest to the pixels. Got it. Thank you. Uh-huh. Anybody else have any questions? Rick, I want to thank you again very much for this class. For those that's interested, in August 7th, Rick will be doing an advanced FPP class. And sounds like he's going to be letting us know a little bit of uh, version 8 that's coming out. So, 
With that, thank you and have a good evening. I'm sorry, John. Did